is Roger Green, host of the Surfing the Nash Tsunami podcast. Today, we are offering six conversations from episode 43, our Career Week interviews with Agent Diagnostics CEO Rachel Zayas and Novo Nordisk International Vice President Michelle Long. This conversation incorporates the first part of my interview with Novo Nordisk International Vice President Michelle Long. The conversation focuses on the process by which Michelle came to leave academia and transition to corporate life. Along the way, she covers the importance of mentorship and of really deeply understanding what an individual finds exciting about a career in academia and more specifically in Michelle's case, academic research and how that might translate into corporate life. We each think we know a lot about the jobs we do, or at least I hope we do, but we know far less about other jobs we might find intriguing or valuable and exactly what makes the people with whom we interact good at what they do. These interviews with Rachel Zayas and Michelle Long provide the kind of in-depth view into other career possibilities that most of us rarely encounter in everyday life. I'm not looking for a job in either of these situations, but I feel I learned a tremendous amount from both of them. I'm confident you will as well. So just sit back, listen, learn, enjoy. And when you're done, join the dialogue in our LinkedIn discussion group. So the uh, second half of our Career Week interviews, we have with us our friend Michelle Long. The first time we met Michelle on this podcast, she was in academia up in Boston doing her hepatologic epidemiology work. I think I got all that out without screwing up any of the syllables and seemingly happy with what uh, you were doing. And then I turn around and you're on your way to Novo Nordisk. And that was, I guess, what, about 14, 15 months ago? Michelle Long. That's right. Yeah. Uh, now, about a third of this audience is academic, and I'm going to casually guess some of those people, if they had a chance to do it, if they knew how to get there, would like to be where you are now as compared to where you were then. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about your experience, what motivated you to want to do it, how the transition works, what people can learn from all that. And then, by the way, we'll talk a little bit after that about Nash, but uh, let, let's stay here to start. First of all, where are you today? Uh, so I'm in Princeton, New Jersey today, actually, visiting the Nova Nordisk U.S. affiliate office. So you live in Boston, right, still? Mm -hmm. How much of your time do you get to spend in Boston these days? So my setup actually is that I work for Novo Nordisk in Denmark. So I work for the headquarters team. So actually, this is the first time I've gone to the U.S. affiliate office in New Jersey. But I'm in Boston and I work remotely. And then I go to Denmark about one week every other month. That's not bad at all. Except for the fact that you go to conferences and stuff like that. That's probably about as much as your family got to see you when you were in academia, just to guess. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I still go to the same conferences I was going to before. So let, let's go back 18 months or however, well, actually, maybe it's not 18 months. When was it that you first were contacted about this idea of coming to Nova Nordisk? Yeah, I would say it was about 18 months ago that I was first contacted and then I started in July of 22. Was that something that you had been looking to do or was it something that just landed on you or how did all this come about? It's a good, it's a good question. I mean, I would say it landed on me. I wasn't looking actively, but at the same time, I had an open mind. Also, a prepared mind is, is open to change and that's where they found me when they came looking 18 months ago. A prepared mind is open to change. That's that's a great statement. Could you please elaborate a little bit about how you were prepared? So I would say that I was prepared um, because I also saw others go through this transition, including some people that were very close to me. My primary research mentor at the Framingham Heart Study, Caroline Fox, in 2015, she had left a tenured track position. She was an intramural researcher, scientist at NHLBI and working at the Framingham Heart Study and, you know, to me had the dream job, right? She was fully supported to do science. She could mentor, she could teach, she could keep her clinic and she didn't have to apply for grants. I mean, it was really amazing. It was such a gift actually having her as a mentor because she actually had time to mentor me properly and was uh, hugely influenced my career. She is the voice that's in my head. You know, we would meet once a week for an hour. I mean, it was a gift of time that you can never get from a mentor. Anyway, you know, she actually left this to me at the time seemed like a, a dream job to take a position at, at Merck and to, to lead their pharmacogenetics and pharmacogenomics in diabetes. You know, when she left, she said, keep an open mind, Michelle. Like you never know where science is going to take you. And she was really, really keen on making sure that we as young scientists, her mentees, understood that there are different career paths to take in academics and that 
their pluses and minuses, but not to just shut something down because it's unknown. Um, so she definitely gave me the courage to say, okay, you know, I told I told Caroline that I would that I would keep an open mind, and and here we are. So you were cruising along, and then they kind of found you. Yeah, that's right. How did that process start? How did it go? When you look back on the period from uh, I guess March to July, how did all that work? I could tell you a little bit about like my mindset, and I think this is a very it's obviously a very personal decision, and so I think I want to take a step back and think about you know let me just tell you a little bit about myself and and how I came into medicine, and because it really was even before this recruiter interaction that I had um, 18 months ago, there was a lot of self-reflection. And that was also in the setting of COVID. And I think a lot of people did a lot of self-reflection and I did as well. And, you know, I was thinking about what happened, like why I even went into to medicine and thinking about even as a child, I always wanted to be a scientist. I had no idea what a scientist was. There was no scientists in my family, no physicians in my family, extended family, no potential influence. But I was the kid, you know, crawling under the deck looking for bugs and looking under my microscope of what they are. I was very curious. I was a very curious sort of odd child. You probably can picture this. That was what I wanted to do with science. I mean, I even found uh, an essay I wrote to college uh, when I was going through papers at home about I want to be a research scientist and my sort of very naive description of what this looks like. You know, and then as I was going along, I learned why, right? I wanted to medicine, like I completely fell in love with medicine and the idea of I can do science and it could help people like, yes, please. That sounds amazing. So that was that was why. And um, then, you know, as I was going through training in medical school, I learned who I said, I learned that from another mentor of mine, when you're deciding about where you're going to specialize, you not only have to love the disease, but you have to love the whole package, the patients and everything that comes along with them. And for me, it was always the liver. I mean, from day one, those were my people. So that became very clear. And I had all that figured out. And then finally, how do I want to do this? And then I was thinking and in this time in COVID and everything gets flipped upside down, you know, what is it that I really love about my work in academic medicine? And how do I want to do science? And it was the mentoring. It was the team science. And the thing that really killed me in COVID was the lack of interaction with my colleagues. And I'm not talking the colleagues I had in Boston because, you know, I was at a smaller academic center in Boston where I was the expert in fatty liver. So I didn't have a lot of sparring partners in my back pocket. So where I got that was going to meetings. And I felt such a emptiness in COVID times, you know, not being able to go to meetings and have these interactions with the, you know, all the people that you come that come on the podcast with you, right? These are the people that I love to see and to chat about science the whole time in between sessions, after sessions, before sessions, during, and it's so much fun. So I realized that for me, the how I wanted to do science was was very collaborative. Collaborative, and you know, I wanted to be talking about fatty liver disease on a high level as much as I could. I mean, those were the things that really made me happy. And of course, I love seeing patients and I still get to see patients. We can talk about that. But for me personally, seeing patients wasn't the thing that really drove me to happiness. It was really thinking about science on this high level. That was sort of the context. And then Caroline Fox, one of her another nugget of wisdom was, look, she said to me, I find people on LinkedIn. So you need to come up with a LinkedIn, you know, make a LinkedIn profile. So I literally went onto her LinkedIn profile and made I saw how she did it and I did it the same way. And I said, okay, let's just sit there and see what happens. And a recruiter for Nova Nordisk reached out to me that way. And I deleted it and went about my day. And then I was like three o'clock in the morning. I don't sleep so well. And I got to thinking, wait a second, that was Nova Nordisk. And, and they're doing a lot in, in fatty liver disease. And they're aligned with leaders in metabolic health. And this is right in the square of where, you know, what you find interesting and what you've been studying from all the epi work you've been doing in the framium heart study why did you delete that why not just give them you know why not just see what they have to say and um so that's how it started and i mean i totally went in blind i had i called the recruiter back and said okay like let's let's have a first conversation and you know we had a conversation and she ended the call saying you know this job is in copenhagen and i'm 
like, no, nope, I did not know this job was in Copenhagen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that was interesting too. And then I said, look, I'm not going to be able to change locations because I have young kids and I'm married to a physician and that's complicated. And so if you want to consider me further, this has to be a remote position. And that also became a possibility as they, you know, as our conversations continued. And so that's how we got to the setup that I have today. What was it in the process of the conversations that enticed you? I was extremely naive. I mean, to some extent, I still am, right? I'm learning every day about what industry is. And we do not educate our trainees enough about it. It is a total black box. And it's it's super complicated, especially for a huge organization, Big Pharma, because there's roles and, and jobs within the company that you have no idea about. And so first, you know, I had some initial conversations with the recruiter, and then I got to talk to the people that I would be working with who are actually hiring me at this level. You know, I went through a few rounds of interviews with the recruiter mostly. And it was those uh, conversations where finally, of course, this is all happening, you know, on European time. So like after I have the conversation, I go and wake my husband up at like six o'clock in the morning saying, oh boy, I think I kind of want this job now. <laughs> but it was, it was really that that turned it for me because I saw that the position that I would be in, in uh, basically the, the part of the organization where they're they're actively designing the trials and sitting amongst a group of physicians who are talking and thinking about fatty liver disease every day. And then they also had, knowing that I was making this transition from industry, they had a colleague or who's now a colleague uh, come on who, who had made this transition one year prior to also you know help see things from my perspective. And what he said to me, he's like, Michelle, it's unbelievable. Like the environment is so rich. Like you get to start at the highest level of having these conversations. It's, it's really, really surprising and impressive and it's really, really fun. It really spoke to me in this post-COVID or dirt, you know, state of that's a, this is exactly what I've been craving. This is exactly how I like to do science. And if you say that there are people, you know, awake in Denmark at six o'clock in the morning who want to talk about fatty liver on a high level with me, like, yes, please, I'm, I'm, I'm there. And so that really is what sold it to me because at the same, you know, I realized that I could be doing all the things that I love, helping the patients that I love, still going to the conferences, interacting, doing uh, all those things that I that I like, being really in the weeds in, you know, a disease that is fascinating and potentially have a have an even bigger impact. Once I became interested, it became very, very difficult to talk me out of it. And now back to Roger. We hope you've enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions or comments about the content of this conversation or the entire episode, please put them in the review section of the page from which you downloaded the conversation or send an email to questions at surfingnash.com. We'll be back next week with a more typical tsunami episode, this one focusing on patient screening and women's health issues. Until then, stay safe, surf on. We'll see you on the podcast. Bye-bye now.